So thanks very much, Emer. So yes, yeah, so what I want to talk about in, in this session is some of the work that we've done in the past um, and some of the ongoing work that we have uh, going on at ICRAG in terms of constraint mapping and, and ground model development. So as, as Emer alluded to, we have these grand challenges within ICRAG, one of which is earth science and society. And this is really about how humans and human development interact with the earth systems. So we talk a lot about geohazards, you would have heard that word. So a geohazard is essentially any sort of geological state or condition that might impact or, or cause a problem or a risk for, for, for development. So at ICRAG, we're, we're very interested in these and how we can look into them and, and potentially manage them. So under this earth science and society challenge, we have a couple of different tasks which are really identifying, monitoring and mitigating geohazards to protect society, uh, researching the geological causes of these geohazards, and then looking to develop technologies which will support geotechnical engineering in this area. So this feeds nicely then into some of the actions from the Climate Action Plan that, that Niall alluded to, to earlier. So one of the actions there is to develop a new offshore renewable energy development plan, which may lead, or is looking to lead us from a developer-led model into a plan-led model. And we think a lot of our research will, will feed into that. And we were delighted to be asked onto the steering committee for that recently. Um, obviously, one of the reason, main reasons why we're here is that we're looking to build five gigawatts of, of wind by 2030. There'll be a lot of technical challenges to this, so we feel that our research into geohazards and engineering can ultimately help so, um, overcome a lot of these challenges. And then finally, as, as Owen alluded to there, there's a lot of really good work ongoing with the Inframar programme. We use a lot of this data, and we're looking to support the Inframar programme as well with, with new technologies and new ways of, of doing things as well. So before we undertake any sort of uh, constraint mapping or ground modelling, understanding the geological history of a particular area and how past geological processes have impacted on an area are, are quite critical. So you can see here in, in this image, uh, 34 odd thousand years ago, most of the British and Irish Isles was, was covered in, in ice as, as ice advanced from the north. And this had profound impact on our, our, our landscape and on our, on our seabed. So understanding how this happened and, and, and what it meant for the, the seabed is quite important. So the likes of myself and Andy Wheeler, Susanna Tote and Steve McCarran in, in, in the first phase of ICRAG were, were very much interested in looking at uh, glacial processes and how this um, caused different morphodynamics and offshore uh, quaternary stratigraphy and we've published some, some work on that of late. So we, have a, we, we feel like we have a very good understanding of, of past geological processes across the Irish continental shelf. So then this feeds directly into how we go about a lot of our sort of constraint mapping. So this particular work here is a, a body of work that was funded through uh, Gavin and Darley Dew Solutions and the Geological Survey of Ireland, where we took a lot of that really beautiful Inframar data that Owen spoke about earlier and, and added a bit of kind of geological nuance to it in terms of putting it all into a, a GIS database and analysing it in order to characterise the geomorphology and the, and the sedimentology in the context of, of offshore renewable energy development and the implications that certain geological features might have for, for development. So in particular there you can just see in the map um, the way that the, the, the coast is kind of colour coded with, with different polygons and these polygons relate, re relate to different features such as soft sediments um, and mobile sediments and shallow gas. So in the table then you can just kind of see some of the potential constraints that these particular features might offer to a development. So this particular body of work is, is available through the, the Inframar data viewer and, and it, it allowed us then to kind of develop further projects looking at specific geographic areas but also particular geological um, features. So one project that we, we've been looking at over the last while is the DESIRE project. So this is work uh, carried out, uh, funded through uh, SEI with our, our um, industry partner Apex. And this is the, you know, the geological version of the A-team here, um, Mike Long and co. So we've been looking at the north part of the Irish Sea in particular um, and looking at some of the geological features up there. So we built a, a, um, a ground model initially and we kind of identified three main challenges, those being uh, soft sediments, uh, which have low bearing capacity, glacial deposits, which are heterogeneous and can be quite hard. And then of course, there's a, a quite a substantial amount of, of shallow gas in that area. So using this ground model, we planned a two week survey, which we executed um, in conjunction with Apex and also with some support from the GSI. So Ronan O'Toole at the time was, was a great help to us there. Um, we chartered two vessels um, for the two weeks and carried out um, some refraction work 
um, underwater multi-channel analysis of sur surface waves, multi-channel sparker, and over the course of the two weeks, we, we surveyed 16 sites and gathered about 84 kilometers of data. So we had good weather, good team, as you can see here in the photographs, and, and it was a very successful survey. So just to talk a small bit more about um, MASW, or multi-channel analysis of surface waves, and, and what that is and what it can give us. So um, it's been extensively used in onshore geotechnical investigations, um, but over the last while, APEX and, and, and members of the team at UCD have been applying it in, in an offshore setting. So effectively, it means putting a, a cable on the seabed um, using uh, two vessels. Uh, one then becomes the, the receiving vessel, so uh, the one here is stationary, and we have all our recording equipment, and the other vessel, then the smaller vessel, would have a source, this might be an air gun, which releases energy, um, which is then recorded um, by the cable um, as, as, as shear waves, basically. So this shear wave uh, profile, um, we can derive certain geotechnical parameters from, parameters from that, in particular looking at the small strain stiffness, or Gmax. So this is um, of direct implication for bearing capacity of foundations. So Gmax can be measured in a lab, but by using these geophysical techniques, we, we don't have the costly component of having to go out and, and do a borehole, gather the data, bring, it, or bring, bring the samples back and, and do them in a lab. We can measure the bulk response of sediment um, in situ rather than just using an individual discrete sample. So it's quite good that way. Um, and it gives us a really good determination of sediment type and really complements other techniques that we use like cone penetration testing. So over the course of the two weeks, as I said, we, we hit about 16 different uh, locations across this part of the North Irish Sea. Um, and then by gathering these geophysical profiles and combining them with geotechnical profiles, um, we can then develop um, an understanding of the seabed and how it, the subseabed and how it varies across an area. So you'll see that the area is kind of color coded by, by zones. So each of these different polygons re re um, relates to a different geological setting. And so this is, might be of implications for foundation selection. So for each of these locations, then we have a, a kind of a profile like this. Um, whereby for the first three profiles there, A, B and C, they're from CPT profiles, and then the final one is our, is our VS. So we get very good complementary data between the two, and we can use all these data sets in tandem to characterize the subsurface. So you might see some kind of very faint um, lines running across these, and they indicate various different geological units. So I think of a particular interest here is just to note that this area, the cone resistance values are, are quite low. In particular, in this upper five meter um, layer here, where we get very low cone resistance values, and also negative pore pressure values. So very, very soft sediments. And again, whilst this might be of implications for foundations, but for kind of cable trenching and cable installation, it will be. So then furthermore, um, up in this kind of area here in, in the Northwest, where we have very shallow glacial deposits, um, putting a CPT probe through these can be quite problematic. So as you can see here, we, we met with CPT refusal um, at just under five meters here. However, from our, our VS profile, we can get a, a pretty good characterizing profile down to about 15 or 20 meters. So in areas where CPT might work, we can use the complementary VS profile, which is, which is quite useful. So then moving on to some other work that is, is more recent and ongoing is the, is the IMOR project. So again, this is SEI funded project um, with GDG as the lead. So uh, Guillaume and Andy at, at UCC have been doing a lot of work looking again at the Inframar data to develop these really nice um, isopack maps and, and, and geophysical maps looking at various subs, the dis distribution of various different subsurface layers. So this particular unit here is the, is the top of the glacial deposits in, in the North Irish Sea. So we can look at the various different um, features. So the eagle-eyed among you might see some lovely lineations up here and a, a kind of a trough structure there. And then look at these features in relation to um, previous ice limits and understand ice sheet dynamics in that regard. So we use this information as well to, to target locations, to, to characterize these different subsurface units using uh, CPT profiles. So as you may or may not be aware, we can use geotechnical data to kind of infer um, soil behavior types um, using these kind of uh, Robertson classification charts. So by plotting various different geotechnical parameters against each other, we get an indicative 
sediment type. So what we're looking to do under the IMOR project is, is really see how applicable these charts are to Irish deposits or can we, can we upgrade them or can we develop them further um, in the project. So using um, the, the isopack and subsurface data that, that Guillaume has developed, we targeted a number of locations. Um, as, as Adana spoke about earlier, we went out in January, um, got some lovely weather. So this is a January morning on the Irish Sea, if you could believe it, um, with a 25 tonne CPT that we were uh, putting off the back and uh, gathering really good quality uh, geotechnical data across the area. So we're currently working up this data um, and we're looking at different applications of its use in terms of machine learning and, and generating uh, CPT applications. Suppose just to summarise then what I've been talking about, I'd like to think that from what I've shown that we've shown that in ICRAG we have very good capabilities in terms of carrying out desktop studies, doing field work and, and actually getting out and getting stuff wet and gathering data on acquisition surveys and then having the complementary laboratory testing which um, Dave Igo will speak about a bit further and then integrating all this data together to form you know, decent ground models which can use us to, to site um, foundations. So then Building on this then we have expertise and we've generated various different outputs in, in the areas of constraint mapping, um, understanding past ground conditions and, and so forth and a lot of this information is in publications and in, 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 on the, in Inframar Data Viewer. But I suppose what's most important for us at iCRAG is, is getting this research out of the research centres and into the hands of, of the developers and, and, and who, people who can actually use it. So what's really important for us is this knowledge transfer um, into industry. So we've responded to various policy consultations in the past, but most importantly, I suppose, is that a lot of our data has made it into a number of um, active projects uh, for industry clients with regards to various different kind of site assessments uh, and so forth. So suppose just to close, um, when I first started in working with this industry seriously in about 2014, um, it was a very different landscape. Uh, Kevin Daly is in the crowd was showing me the ropes in Electric at the time. Um, and it was a very different regime, very different ambition at that stage. And it's been wonderful to see the, the, the sector grow and, and realise this new ambition. And I suppose just that ICRAG really shares this ambition with, with the industry and, and with the government and we're very keen to help. So a lot of today is, is learning from you in terms of how we can deliver this help. And we're very welcome to hear your questions. Thanks very much. Does anybody have anybody questions at this yeah. stage? We have a lot of time for questions. Yeah. No? I'm better at answering questions in the social reception anyway. You'll get much more embellished answers. <laughs> <laughs> no? Is it just a fixed foundation? Yeah, I suppose that's one thing is right, is that a lot of what we've talked about there is, is kind of looking at the, the East Coast, um, because primarily that's where the initial development is going to be, but I suppose a lot of the products and techniques, methodologies that we're developing are, are equally as applicable to sort of the west coast, south coast in terms of looking at, at floating options as well. So we're not, we are technology agnostic effectively, you know, so it's just to highlight that as well, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, it will in due course, so I suppose we have to go through the kind of QA, QC process initially and make sure that it's, 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 it's good and then see if we can get it published initially, um, but it, it, will be, it will be available um, in, in some format in the future. Oh, Andy? Sorry. Hello? Sorry. There, you mentioned a lot about the, the North Irish Sea. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of interest in development further south. Is there, you know, academic seismic data beyond just shallow sub-bottom profiler data further south that might be of interest that there's people working on or yeah. people working on? Yeah, so I suppose like across, this is an important point to, to make actually is that, you know, in fairness, Owen highlighted that, the, you know, the amount of data that's available from, from Infomar um, for, for across the Irish Shelf, but like in-house and ICRAG, we've been carrying out our own surveys over the years um, with the support from the Marine Institute. So like researchers within ICRAG hold a lot of data that's, that's, that's relevant to these areas and is, is kind of sparker uh, level material or grade um, data, so quite good. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of complementary data held within ICRAG that we can bring, bring to bear on, on projects um, for kind of site specific areas.
Yeah, yeah so, sorry, just to ask a little bit more about the constraint map, and uh, obviously you're talking very much on, on the geological and the geophysical side, but is there anywhere at the minute that they're combining the habitat map in, in the same raft of information? Is that all in, on Infomar as well, or are, are we looking at two separate sources of information that we've got to pull together I ourselves? I, I suppose Owen can probably speak to a bit more, but in, in fairness to Infomar, they provide the baseline data. It's 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 the raw it's the raw or the process stuff but without interpretation as such so habitat mapping and and all of that kind of needs a bit of uh, nuance to it and, and and kind of additional work added to it which the in fairness to gsi and and, and infomar you know may not have the capacity to do so we we do undertake some of that work and you'll actually be hearing from andy wheeler later who will speak a lot to to that side of the house where we're doing some of that habitat mapping and multi-criteria decision making using um, kind of more environmental or other, otherwise focused data. So I recommend you listen to what Andy has to say and then we can have a discussion then afterwards about, about how data is used and the habitat mapping side, if that's okay. Mark, I was just going to quickly ask him, um, you and your team are doing some absolutely brilliant work and uh, I really like the output, some useful tools, definitely. Um, I'm just wondering, and it's a bit of a tricky question given everyone in the room, but um, with the, the constraint maps, do you feel that they're getting picked up and used right from the first stage, decision-making policy stage, where perhaps they could have a real influence on where you may or may not want to auction sites? You know, do you feel they're getting picked up right from the go or could, they, could that be a useful tool from the get-go? Yeah, so I suppose in, in Ireland the, the, the model is quite different perhaps to the UK where at the moment it's very much developer-led, so the developer decides where, where they might like to go. But I suppose just on, on that point, um, we've been quite lucky to work very closely with, with Gavin and RDG Solutions um, and they would do a lot of, you know, developers go to them and ask them to do these initial site um, characterizations. And in fairness, the, the team at GDG have taken our, our research because they've funded a lot of it and have applied it in those first stage um, reports for, for clients, which is great. But moving forward now, like Ireland will look towards a, a plan-led model. So that's kind of been led by the OEDP st steering group and they have picked up on this. So I, I think into the future, as we go towards the plan-led one, they're, they're aware of this information and they're including it within their GIS spatial mapping. So, so we're hopeful it will make a difference there.